Hey everyone, welcome to Pop XP. And before the show starts, make sure to click that subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications when we go live and we upload awesome new content. And don't forget, if you can, make sure to share our stream on all your social media outlets. We appreciate it, and thanks for helping us grow the Pop XP channel. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Steve and Samino Says Boom Show special edition. A special edition because today we're doing a special tribute to the life and legacy of the recent passing of John Ramita Sr. And uh, we wanted to make this episode live and for everybody to enjoy it. And we have our host of today. Yeah, our co-host, right. Yeah, Roy Thomas, of course, <laughs> and Steve down below. And Niall Scala. Niall, tell us what we need to do, brother. Hey, everyone. While we, before we get started, make sure to look below, click that subscribe button, and smash that bell to get notifications so you can catch some amazing streams like we're doing tonight. And uh, gentlemen, I'm, I'm excited for this. I'm honored to be doing this and very honored that our guests are willing to take the time to uh, share some memories. Yeah, and uh, what we're going to do is, uh, you know, uh, people are going to come in and out, and hopefully that uh, we're going to get a nice uh, uh, round and a celebration of everybody talking about John Ramita's, uh, uh, his inspiration to them and their experiences in their life. And uh, so this is going to be great. And uh, so before we start, uh, Steve, what, what can we say about this, uh, this episode and uh, this day that we're celebrating? Well, first things first, again, I'm very honored to be here amongst, you know, uh, legends. And also, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing some first-hand accounts, uh, some, you know, some nice uh, material. And uh, so, yeah, it's going to be wonderful. And remember, first, anything, it's a celebration. Uh, you know, it's not a good, it's not going to be a maudlin affair. It's going to be a celebration of a life, uh, long work, which will be living forever. Yes. yes. And, and uh, before before we bring on our guests, I would I want to point out that Roy here created co-created two characters. Right, Roy, with John. Who are the what, t tell us about that really quick. Well, the first one, I think, was Satana, where Stan just had a name. And then John and I had to do a had about a couple of days to do a three or four page story to get him into a magazine, which is strange because it turned out to be the only story John and I ever did together. <laughs> All the stuff we did together, talking in covers and this and that, we never got a chance to actually do a story together. So this was one. And the other was, was when I had the idea of uh, for Wolverine, I gave the, the story assignment to, uh, to Len Wein. And then I went in and I went to John and said, we need a character, you know, Wolverine and design the character. And John says he uh, said later he said he didn't know what it was. He thought it was a female wolf, you know. So he just had to look <laughs> it up. But he, that he did, and he totally designed the character with no input from me or from Glenn or whatever. So, you know, so we, we got that kind of thing going. Those those characters have a certain uh, legacy. One of them in particular, I think, has been very popular in recent years. Okay, look at that. So we just wanted to get that. So, without further ado, Nile. Yes. So joining us right now, we've got Mr. Steve Englehart back in the on the channel. Welcome back, Steve. Thank you. Nice to be here. We've got Brian Polito in the house. Everyone's Greetings, getting everyone. sworn. <laughs> and we have our honorary guest tonight, everyone, the legend himself, Mr. John Ramita Jr. <laughs> Welcome, John. Well. We lost audio on John. Hey, John, just lo log in and log back out. Straight, we had all that time. And suddenly... It must be the meatballs. It must be. It's the Marsala. It's the Marsala. The Marsala. Hey, yeah. if, he, if he logs in and logs back out, it'll fix that. Sometimes it does it on the phones. You want to... Uh, no, look at this. I... So while 
while I get John straightened out, why don't uh, if you guys want to start sharing any stories or anything? Well, oh, well, Roy, why don't you start? Why don't you start when your first when your first meeting? Yeah. Well, I remember it very well because uh, it was 1965 in July. Uh, I'd been working at Marvel about two weeks in the middle of July, and I'm sitting there at my, my little corrugated desk uh, in the office with Paul Brasky and Joe Steinberg, and I was wondering with typewriter, and Saul Brasky comes over to me and tells me, you want me to meet someone who worked here, who worked for Marvel before, and is going to be coming back to work for Marvel. I look up and say, when are you to John Romita? So, and I and I said, oh, I said, Mr. Romita, it's such a pleasure to meet you. I said, I'm such an admirer of the Captain America work that you uh, you did back in like, 1954. There we he go. practically fainted, he told me later, because he didn't believe anybody <laughs> remember this work from like 11, 12 years before. And okay, but to okay. me, I can hear everything now. Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> well, look who's here. Okay. <laughs> we have some technical difficulties. <laughs> oh, no worries. Welcome, Jim, everyone. Jim, we got Jim yeah, Stein right, and Jamie Jim. Jameson in the house. Hi. Ladies and gentlemen, people, how hey, are you? Jamie. Hello, hello. <laughs> So uh, what we were doing, we're like, so John, since you came, uh, Roy was talking about when uh, he first met John Ramita, and uh, and uh, in what, what year was that? 65. 65. Go ahead. Go ahead. Repeat. Okay. Well, the basic thing was that he just couldn't believe that, you know, anybody remembered this work of his. And I said, of course, the funny thing is that even now, uh, 16, almost 60 years later, I still consider his Captain America work in 1954 the best work he ever did. You and I used to argue about that. You know, and everything because that was that perfect combination of Jack Kirby and Milt Kniff, and it was just a perfect marriage. I could see it even at the age of thirteen and fourteen. But anyway, we we very quickly began to. Uh, it, it, I remember he told me he'd come back to work there, and Stan had promised him by luring him away from this uh, job he had coming up, the advertising company. He promised him he would only come in, but he could. He only had to ink. John, Stan, Stan promised him, you'll never have to pencil. You don't want a pencil, you don't have to pencil. Of course, as soon as he got him in, it took about a week or two, you know, before he, well, you know, you want to pencil this and pencil that. The next thing you know, he's doing Daredevil and Spider-Man, you know. Oh, look, so. He so go ahead. Proud of that Captain America work. Very proud of that stuff he did at that age. Um, yeah. And I, you look at it, it is. It's a Milton Kniff-esque look. It's beautiful stuff. Agreed. Those great big shoulders and that skinny waist on that Captain America, very yeah. funny looking. Yes. Yeah. He had, he told me he put one over on Stan for that because he didn't like drawing the little the three little circles around the shield. So after a couple of issues, he he told me, you probably know this, John. He got Stan to approve the idea that it was going to be color held, we you know, and everything, and there wouldn't be any lines with the stripes. They would just hold it with red and white color. Well, you know, and I know, we all know how lousy that. That meant, and of course, you look at those books, it's just like red and white blobs <laughs> all the way through. But it's I at least I'm not out of ever having to draw all those circles. Fantastic. I never heard that story. That's a great story. John, I, I would like, how did you feel when, uh, during the, see, me, Steve, and Niall, we, we kind of grew up during the 70s as kids, and all your father's work was all over the toys. And all you know, you saw Herb Trimpey, but you, I, I occasionally saw uh, 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 on some cards Mr. Starlin's. But your father's work was everywhere, and it became the definitive Spider-Man as a kid. And and just seeing all that, what did you, what did you, what was your experience in first seeing your father like starting to do these larger-than-life characters and seeing it everywhere? It had to be. Wow, yeah, actually, it actually helped out as uh, socially. Uh, if you were, if we were awkward at that time, it was a common, common conversation piece to have. And suddenly, it was people would say, "Wow, is that what your father does?" Instead of, "Hey, Ramita, you're an asshole." You know, <laughs> <laughs> everything changed. And then, of course, when when uh, uh, when Spider Man got bigger and bigger and bigger, it was just a matter of time before he was a famous guy and people wanted to ask me about it. But it was a wonderful time because I, I became from I went from being socially awkward to being more comfortable because I had a famous father. It was fantastic. How were you socially awkward? You're always a good-looking guy. Get out of here. Uh, well, there's always social awkwardness when it comes to women. 
I saw a picture of you with a nice looking mullet recently. I had the, <laughs> I had the I can share mullet. that, you know. <laughs> I had the best mullet, better than all the wrestlers. It was the best mullet in the world. The silk shirt and the chains and the mullet. <laughs> Jamie, I'll, Jamie, uh, nice meeting you, but I'll tell you this. It's funny that Roy, Steve Englehart, and Jim Starlin all have the same hairdo from the 70s to today. Right? They're all in the same look. You guys can look as soon as on my work hair. Come back six months earlier, I got a flat top. Spider-Man. So, so Steve Englehart, tell us your first experience meeting Mr. Mar Mr. Ramita. Well, when I went to work at Marvel, I took a six-week fill-in job um, and I was put in the cubicle that faced the entrance door at the Marvel Studios so that when people would come in, I would be the guy who would deal with them and people didn't come in all that often. It wasn't the thing, but behind me in the next cubicle was John Ramita and Herb Trimpey doing the art corrections or whatever it was that they were asked to do at the time. And so they were like my first friends at Marvel. When I went in there um, as a aspiring fan, whatever, um, they couldn't have been nicer, both Herb and, and Johnny. Um, you know, breaking me into the thing, telling me what was going on. Um, and so my six weeks at Marvel there wasn't a day that went by that I, you know, that I wasn't over in their cubicle talking to them about doing stuff or just hanging out or whatever. Johnny was, you know, completely welcoming. I mean, it didn't, it, I, I was absolutely nobody. And he was, you know, he was sure you're part of the bullpen now. Come on in. Um, nice. Nice to know. Nice to hear that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that I would mention is in those days I was doing art. And I did a romance store. I did two romance art jobs, one of which was inked by Jack Abel and one of which was inked by Johnny Ramita. And and I sure looked good, you know. Ramita <laughs> <laughs> had a habit of fixing everything he worked on, even when it didn't need fixing, but he especially fixed all my stuff. Right. Yeah. All your heads. Watch your head. Mr. Mr. Starlin, Thanos himself, what, tell us your first experience meeting on Mr. Ramita. You know, I don't remember exactly the first time, but uh, him and Frank Giacoy were the ones who were up at the office all the time. And uh, they I don't think either one of them at the time wanted to be the art director. So when I showed up there, I sort of got stuck with the, the job as their first one doing the cover layouts with Stan. And uh, John was always very supportive, encouraging. Um, the only criticism he ever gave me was getting hit the Spider Man's uh, webs correct. He, he was you know, always he did that with a lot of artists. Never get it right. He did that with a lot of artists. <laughs> and that, there's something about that going against the curve of the arm and the leg. He did that with a lot of people. You're right. But what I had with uh, you and your family is when I, one of my later coming, coming back to the Marvel from D.C. or wherever I was at, your mom was working up there. Your dad was working up there. You were working up there. I was coming back to this corporation, but it felt like this family business. Um, you guys yeah, were all you know like performing. Uh, everybody everybody was, that was working for Marvel was very safe at that time. Yeah. You had that three family members that nobody was worried about driving. They were safe everywhere in the city. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Mr. Polito, your first introduction to Mr. Ramita. Well, full disclosure, everybody, I haven't had, I did not have the great pleasure of meeting John Ramita Sr. in person. However, as a lifelong comics fan, reading his work was among the first times I was able to put together a creator with a name and start having that understanding. So it was around the amazing Spider-Man run in the, the 110s where a, per, a friend brought over a stack, maybe a year's worth of books. 
And the first thing that impressed upon me was the quality, and this is even as a 13 or 14 year old, is the quality of the draftsmanship of the covers. They were incredibly impactful. And as I was reading these stories, the even as a kid, the storytelling was masterful. It was there was a great sense of adventure. But I, what I also particularly adored is that the men were handsome, the women were beautiful, <laughs> everything yeah. was bigger than life, and, and it wasn't lost on me. And as as a fan who started to become a little more knowledgeable that people actually do this, it really became clear to me that John Romita Sr. defined Marvel and brought it into the mainstream, in my opinion, at that time. So. The work has always been very impactful and certainly the other folks that are in attendance have had uh have their your work has delighted me tremendously you know steve Englehart, starlin it's uh uh been remarkably and junior of course has been remarkably impactful in my life not only as a comic professional but particularly as a lifelong comic fan so what i did want to say uh to to john jr is uh, yeah, your your father's work in a sense was uh, like the soundtrack of a young comic fan's life, and the, the work has had a tremendous impact. I know not only myself as a fan, but on fandom in general. So I, that's just what I wanted to say. So thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you very much. The yeah, ironic part about what you just said was the man didn't think he had a style, and he wished he wished he had a style. He said, "I see this. I see this guy." And even later on with Kirby's and, the, and the, the Don, even Don Hex and, and all of the other artists that were contemporaries, he felt they had a distinctive style and he didn't. Yeah. And I, the irony is that that was style in and of itself because it was separated from everybody else. But he was uncomfortable with how good everybody else was. And it's, that's the way I have felt for the longest time. There's so a better artists around. Huh. And that's what kept my feet on the ground. And he said, there's always somebody bigger, better, stronger, better look. Well, not better looking, but anyway, bigger, better, stronger, better, 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 better. <laughs> smarter. And his advice was, if you think you're good, you're never going to get better. So do not let yourself get better. Don't yeah. let your ego. And if that man didn't have an ego, how bleep am I supposed to have an ego? <laughs> and that's what it was. Mm. Yeah, yeah uh, John, I wanted to ask you though, um, how was when you were starting to draw and you're getting good, did your father put a lot of pressure on you or were you intimidated? Like how, how do you how do you do that and become as good as you are with your I mean, with I, I just want to know that whole the whole building of that. It was all self-imposed. The man was nothing but supportive and did not ever lord over me in mm -hmm. so much that he wanted me to bring work to him and to show him. Even back as far as college, I would bring it and show it to him. I was ashamed. But he would give me his opinion. I never wanted to lord over it. I, it was all self-imposed intimidation and, and nervousness. And then working on the characters that he was so great at, that made me even more nervous. And uh, again, he was nothing but supportive. And he was a teacher-esque to me. If I came with anything, I said, listen, I just spent these pages, what do you think? And he would give me a little tip. It was as simple as that. The man was wonderful in his support. I got a question, John. Uh, as the son of a you know a fine comic artist like that, do you think that he always thought, or did it have to dawn on him that you were going to make it as a comic book artist, or do you think that you know do you think he saw it from the start, or you think it you know you think he wasn't sure if you would develop into a real professional, or do you think he was just always certain you would, or or didn't know, or what? He was fatherly supportive. But was nervous because I, I heard, recall at some point after I had become relatively established, he said, I was terrified. I thought you were going to be crushed and, and I didn't want to happen to you. But he never let on that he was nervous about it because I would have probably been more terrified if he had said that to me. Yeah. He, was, he was always supportive and answered questions, but I found out later on that he was concerned about me failing. Yes. Well, once you made up the power, you were on your way, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my God. You should have seen the sketch of the Prowler I did, which was skin tight and no and no face showing, just two eye holes. And Dan said, the art sucks, but I love the name. That was <laughs> <laughs> Roy, what, why don't you tell everybody the early dynamics of Stan Lee and John Romita, how, how they got together and the stuff that you saw early in, uh, in their career, early in those days? Well, they were uh, 
pretty much how Stan was with everybody else. Stan's personality dominated the room. But when the two of them together, if I was ever in the room listening, Stan would go as far, and Roy must know this story, but Stan would go as far as getting, crouching up on the on the table to show the awkwardness of Spider-Man because he felt he was drawing too much of an elegant looking Spider-Man a la Daredevil. Here's always so Stan would get up and he would pose up on this table, this senior looking gentleman to me, <laughs> and he had glasses and a suit on top of the table, and I want to see this, and I want to see that. And I'm trying to keep myself from laughing too loud. And Rita Senior would be taking notes. So Rita Senior was never intimidated by Stan. He embraced it and used it. It was great. Yeah. Can you elaborate? One of the things. Okay. Sorry. One, one of the things I remember the most about it was that he was uh, that when Ramita when uh, right in the first month or so after Ditko left, and suddenly you know uh, John was pushed into doing something he did not want to do, which was to draw Spider-Man. He was very happy drawing Daredevil, and he right. knew he was being held in reserve by having to do those two issues with Spider-Man as a guest star, and he, he did not want to go over to Spider-Man. I think he thought Ditko might be back, but even so, he didn't want to do it. And then after they did about, they were just doing about an issue, and then Stan called me in to take notes, and he and John had a, a conference for about an hour or so, you know, and, and he was... And they were just talking about where Spider-Man was going to go, you know, because after all, they were just introducing Mary Jane. And, you know, now what Stan, of course, was really eager about this because for the last year or two, he had really had very little to do with Spider-Man's destiny. I mean, he could have overruled Steve Ditko at any time, but he was letting him plot him. And, but he was a little frustrated because he hadn't been able to have the input on the character he wanted to. Uh, and now suddenly he was like a kid let loose in his own way. He wanted he was going to be able to, you know, take Spider-Man in directions that he could kind of control and work with somebody like, like John, who'd be greatly respected. And uh, they were sitting there talking, t starting ideas of where it would be in six months and this and that, just in a general way, spitballing everything. And finally, Stan looked over at me and he said, you know, you're, you're have a, you have a weird look on your face when you're taking those. I was going to say, <laughs> Why? He, he said, I said, well, I said, it's just, you know, you're talking about the future of this character and take it seriously. Like it's a life. I said, this, this just isn't the way, you know, I thought of comic books as being done. It just, you know, usually everything was kind of by, and, and it was really by kind of the seat of their, the seat of their pants and so forth. But in this case, they, you know, they, they wanted to map it out. They got very, very serious about it. It was really fun to be in on that one hour that in a way set the tone for the next several years of Spider-Man. Wow. Hey, Jim, did you have something? Yeah, well, somewhere along those lines, but I also had heard that, and I think it was, I think it was from your father, that he was the second son of an Italian family, and the, the expectations was that he was supposed to go into the priesthood. Was it? Uh, that was that was a suggestion by my grandfather. <laughs> and my grandfather, my grandfather thought he was a Martian. The only that he came from nowhere. They had no idea where it came from. <laughs> my grandfather was a, a woodworker and a blue collar worker, and, and he, my father was drawing the, uh, the Statue of Liberty from manhole cover to manhole cover in Brooklyn. And my grandfather thought this man was from outer space, <laughs> but it was it's an odd. I don't know about that being true or not about the priesthood, but I heard that rumor. Yes. Yeah, I heard it a number of times. I guess you and the rest of the family and the rest of the fans are. Very happy that he didn't go that way. Amen. And amen. Yeah. Roy mentioned something about that, that, that uh, story conference process, how it progressed actually was the great story. Is that once Stan worked with Senior on a couple of books, he almost said, Of course, I don't have to write this. I just give it to him like this. And that's where these great story conferences would happen. Remedia Senior would have his little scratch pad. Stan would talk. He would talk the plot to Remedia Senior. And it, it was that was where the Marvel method blew up because it was a matter of getting the the, the synopsis to the, the artist, and that's how I learned how to do it. For me to see you go from that kind of thing and to bridge it five or six pages from a sentence of Stan's uh, story, that's brilliant. That's the Marvel method, so to speak. Yeah, and John, you got a super chat. Yeah, I have a question, John. Um, you were obviously a little kid, so I don't know how much you would know about this. But to the to the point that your dad took over Spider Man, Spider Man was a Ditko thing, you know. I mean, it was it had that super Ditko thing going on, and part of that was that we kept seeing Mary Jane from the back dressed like she was from the nineteen forties. 
<laughs> and, and I and I and I'm going to say to jump ahead of that, that when we saw Johnny Ramita's Mary Jane, that probably sort of sold the whole thing right then and there. I mean, it was like, and Margaret, this is a good-looking woman yeah. right and now, and, and we finally understand why we were so interested in Mary Jane. But I was wondering, since everything to the point had been Ditko. And Stan wasn't involved that much as well. Was your dad? He didn't want to do it. Roy said, but but was he intimidated at all? The idea of taking over this strip, which had been done by one guy with a very distinct other style for so long. I don't think the word intimidated was in the conversation, but he was uh, concerned that he didn't want to depart too much from the guy before him. But maybe that's considered intimidation. He thought Nico had a great style, and I don't have a style, he said. Mm. Uh, but he managed, he said within a couple of months or a couple of issues, he felt more comfortable. And the issue 108, 109, for some reason, he said that's what made him feel more comfortable. Uh, it was a tribute to Ditko every time he talked about it, but said, how do I, do I keep on giving them what he was giving them, or do I go in my so the un the unsurety of it in his mind was because of the styles and departure. But Stan loved this stuff to, off the right from the get go. Yeah. So did we off the reading him. Yeah. yeah. Nice. I grew up with your with your dad's Spider Man before I knew Ditko's. You know, like I came later in the game, and I mean, he was Spider Man to me. And when I first met him, you know, I was talking comics. I was just like, I don't know. He was asking what I do. I was like. I don't know what I'm really doing, what I want to do. And he's like, sometimes you do things that you don't think you want to do. He was like, I didn't want to do Spider-Man. And I, my jaw hit the floor. How can you say you didn't want to do Spider-Man? He's yeah. like, fast. And uh, he was like, and he was happy that he did. He was like, yeah, at the time I wanted to do Daredevil or, you know, anything else other than Spider-Man. It's like, but it became, became known for Spider-Man. But well, when he became, when he became confident in what he was doing, he had the same attitude as when he was unconfident, inconfident. He just he, he just worked hard, and then he felt, felt he wasn't fast enough and wasn't good enough. That's a Romita trait. It's actually a great trait because you work to get better. And when I'm 105, and I'll be really good. <laughs> that was another thing he said. Never think you're at your best. Like always work hard. Yeah. That was. Well, he a said, quote. I took that I with didn't me. Want to talk too much because I'm, I can hear the doors opening and closing. There's a lot of guineas coming in this house right now, but. He said to me, if you ever get full of yourself, go to a museum in Manhattan. Go to the <laughs> Come out looking like this, he said. You feel like this. Oh, I feel non-existent when I go to the Met. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John. Go ahead, Chief. I don't think uh, Spider-Man's sales really exploded until after your dad's taking over, right? Yeah, yeah I can comment. Uh, when, when John Romita took over Daredevil, from when Wally Wood left, and it was selling quite well as a you know relatively low print run compared to some other books. Uh, within a f three or four or five issues, it had become the best selling percentage. I don't remember the percentages, but I know it was the best selling percentage book at Marvel at the time. In terms of percentages, it had Spider Man or whatever with a lower print run. When he took over uh, Spider Man, it went within about six months from being the second best selling Marvel book to being the best. It was it, it was actually it was John Romita. Who actually made Amazing Spider-Man the top-selling Marvel comic? But the funny thing is, I remember John John mentioning once or twice that in the early days he really didn't think much of uh, the Ditko Spider-Man. Isn't that right? Did he, did he say that? And it took him a while to kind of get into it because it was such a warped style. What he said was it was the style that was a departure from what he was used to, and mm -hmm. when he saw other artists, Kirby stuff, everybody's stuff that had a style, it was a distinctive style. It's not that he didn't think it was good. He said it's style over substance sometimes. Mm -hmm. And 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 it never made him do anything different from what he could do. And he stuck to what he could do. But uh, again, he bemoaned the fact that he had no distinctive style. And it's common. He drew beautiful yeah. women. He drew beautiful women. And that's so, for yep. me to say that, is a big compliment. Because I will, the first thing I can say, if you're a good artist, let me see how you draw a woman. His were beautiful, beautiful women. And I mean, ask him if I, if I'm like, no, no, it's wrong. Yeah. Proportions are wrong. <laughs> Boobs are wrong. You know, <laughs> they'll sit there and say it. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful women. He was a amazing artist. 
I also think he had a great sense of melodrama in the drama. It was always overblown, but that was phenomenal for the work. The real was, I, I've mentioned this a million times that he was a cinephile beyond all cinephiles. That when it was rainy in the summer days, he would put us in front of the TV and we would talk about the movies that were coming on. Or we'd go to see a, a black and white film in a theater and talk about it before the scene was coming. He was telling storytelling whether I knew it or not. And he loved to talk about films and equated comic books with stop action film. It was his famous line to me. Oh, that's cool. That's great. John, John, I know you got to go soon, but I got to ask you something. I'm half Sicilian and I know you're Sicilian, but I have to ask you this. My, my Sicilian side is nuts, tempa, crazy. That's why I'm a little out there. How come the Romitas are the most lovable, nice people that <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. Can you tell me? We owe people a lot of money that are more, are more strong than us. <laughs> <laughs> we owe, so we have to keep our mouths shut. The truth is that the Romita, the Romita side of the family is Calabrese and Bares, and that tempered the Sicilian side. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know you got to go, John, but any yeah. last words you want to say to the fans out there and uh, some last words and yeah. uh, some dedication to your father? I've been reading things about his passing. Uh, I didn't get as affected by his passing as I'm getting affected by the tribute and wonderful things people are saying about him. Uh, I'll try not to get joked up, but he affected so many people and people he didn't know because he was a sweetheart. And not only am I, I well, I try to reach that goal post of being as good. He's the, he's LeBron, the water boy at the end of the bench. I have that to look for, trying to reach it, but so his personality. Man had no ego, and that's the way to be. Brilliant artist with no ego. You don't get that very often. And that's and Steve Houston. Uh, any last words to Mr. Junior here? You know, um, I was actually very fortunate to see uh, John at a, a Spider Man panel in San Diego in 1996. And I was ab actually able to ask him, I said, when you drew the cover to Amazing Spider Man 39, and you had it on your drawing desk, and you're sitting back, and you're thinking, Okay, I'm taking over Spider-Man from Steve Ditko. I'm going to be in charge. I said, when you sat back on, on the drawing desk, did you realize that you had created a masterpiece? Because that is one of the most iconic covers of all time. Yes. And to go into what you're saying, he said, I just hope they liked it. He goes, I sent it off and I was worried that they might not like it. That's and uh, I was like, oh, my word. But you know what cover, but you know what cover he would inflate his chest over number 50 spider-man no more he was more proud of yeah, that cover yeah. because of its reaction it got and he said to this day that's his favorite piece that he ever did wow yeah well i think it's the most famous cover certainly most important cover he probably ever did i, I agree it got awards from a lot of people because yeah. of the, how important yeah. it was Ladies and gentle people, I have to get going, and I apologize because it's short, but I have a lot of time. Oh, JR, tell your mom I'm sending a cheesecake. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You guys are wonderful, and I hope to talk to you all again on the bed. So yeah, start. nice to see you, John. And I just, I just have two, two super chats for you, John, if I can just get those up real quick. He's got to get the pizza ready. Come on. I know, up. I know. Just real quick. Uh, John Malin, uh, thanks for the super chat. Sorry for the loss, John. Right, and then right. I've got uh, one more here. 200 Watt Studio. JRJR, JR, I'm so sorry for your loss. Did your dad give you any advice when you started on Amazing Spider-Man? Uh, advice? Uh, the, the, that line about there's always someone bigger and better and smarter than you. Deal with that and try to get better. It was basically a short conversation. If you, if you think you're good, you're never going to get any better. And that's the one that helped the most. Yeah. Yeah. All right, folks. Thank, all right. Thank, thank you, John. John. Thank you, John. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jamie, this one's for you. I'm sorry that I missed you when I went around talking to you. I apologize for that. Please tell me your uh, your experience with uh, John Ramita, uh, John Ramita, and stuff, and your 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 background with him. I'm well, as I mentioned, I, I met him many many years ago before I wasn't in comics, but he was like Spider Man was my favorite as a kid. Um, my great uncle used to call me. I was obsessed with Spider-Man. He'd call me uh, Jamie Jameson, Amy Jonas Jameson. I mean, just all these names. I mean, Jim, Jim is in my chair. If you look, it is Spider-Man. I was obsessed, but like, I got uh, Spencer, my art manager. Um, he would like FaceTime me with John Sr. 
And I'd have these conversations with him on FaceTime in Virginia and just got to know him even better. And I was his very first FaceTime call, actually. But just getting to know him or talk about, the, you know, like what I said before, that that inform like that, I mean, Junior just said it best. That like, you're never where you want to be with art. And just not to give up and not to take into consideration, like, maybe you don't love what you're doing, but it might be the right path. I just thought that that was always just like a, such good advice. I didn't expect to do comics. I'm the last person that would tell you, yeah, I work in comics now. <laughs> Did not foresee that. But, I mean, it led me here to doing things I didn't want to do. So, But, I mean, just a, a lovely man, just the nicest, the happiest personality, you know, just mm -hmm. just a sweetheart. Wow. And Roy, the family of the Ramita family all started filling up the offices of Marvel. Can you have any stories no, about no, that? No, that was a little after my time. Um, you know, Mrs. Ramita, you know, started coming in a little later to kind of help out. So, uh, I mean, I knew her, you know, and, and so forth. And I knew John when he was a little kid. The funny thing is, I think that uh, John's first, John said, that John Jr. said that his first job was being this uh, sort of the New York editorial assistant and coordinator for Savage Sword of Conan, you know, but I didn't remember it because, you know, I never saw him. I was just, it was just a voice over the phone. I knew it was John Jr., but, you know, I, I just, you know, didn't recall it, but it's kind of strange. So he sort of, you know, made a name for himself after that. But to me, though, there's, I, I, I have forbidden, like in, in Alter Ego or anything else I work on, I, I have forbidden the term John Ramita Sr. You know, yeah, to yeah. me, I, I come from a different thing. No respect to John Reader Jr., who's become a fantastic artist. I worked with him once or twice. I'm happy I did. But to, you know, but there, but there was John Reader Jr. and there's John Ramita. There is no John Ramita Sr. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the rules. <laughs> no, that's just for me. That's, you know, that's because you know, I knew John Ramita for so many years before I knew John Jr. as an artist. So you know, there's, there's not room for him to be to me. Yeah. What, Jim? What? He said this. I think the style guide would say you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I speak as a junior myself. You know, and my father was never called Roy Thomas Senior. <laughs> I was supposed to be James Patrick Junior, and I'm so glad I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Englehart, what's your best work of uh, John Ramita? Like, what what's a work that he's done that that, that impressed you? That you still uh, something that you can still look at that still uh, has a lingering impression on you. Well, all of it, but I would, I would, you know, if I were to single something out, I'd go back to his Daredevil because that was such a nice, nice piece of work. Um, lower key, as Roy said, I mean, it was, it, the world was less spectacular than Spider-Man's world, but it was, but it was, you know, uh, that run was just really nice. And that's where I first really took notice of him. I, I can't remember what I might have seen of his before that. Um, I didn't see those 50s Captain Americas until until later, but... Uh, yeah. You did see them at some stage, though, didn't you, Steve? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what about you, Mr. Polito? Well, you know, I'm biased because I'm a Captain America super fan, so uh, John's run on... Captain America was pretty good. I think it was, am I right, like 138 to 145, thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, great stuff. But I mean, again, I can always go back to the, uh, the covers are insane. I don't, I actually, that's a, gosh, that's a question that had been fun to ask Junior is, what was, was, you, was Senior looking at anything? Or do, did these covers completely come out of his imagination? Because they're very potent, because there's just so much storytelling that's not just a single image you know you you get a sense of story but yeah there's just there's too many to choose from i, I can comment on that in one sense is that you have to remember john sat there in the office you know mostly five days a week and he just worked and he sat and he thought and i don't obviously he had other things but a lot of it you know in his memory maybe he did some research but he, he did so much thinking and just sitting around that, that uh, as you've probably heard the story, Martin Goodman, who would, the publisher who would occasionally in the late 60s wander around there, uh, wander around, come walking through it, he would, he would constantly look in there and he would go into Stan and say, what the hell does John Romita do? He says, I, I, never, I never see, you know, he's, he's, he sort of does a Spider-Man and he's, he's sort of sitting there and so forth. You know, and it was always impossible because as John got more and more dependent upon by Stan, not just to do Spider-Man, but at the same time, even though Stan didn't want to admit it to be like an assistant art director or, a, you know, almost an art director under him, um, at the same time,
time he was doing all that stuff, you know, and doing the stories, he was doing an awful lot, but he but he didn't produce a lot of actual artwork, you know, by volume. And it was it was and John Stan said he had a lot of trouble for various times defending John Romita's job because Martin Goodman, who was a bean counter type, you know, could not see that John was producing enough pages, enough this, enough that. And Stan was constantly having to explain, you know, that you know, he was involved in everything and that, you know, and a lot of the stuff you just couldn't see because he was redoing a cover or he was guiding somebody doing this or guiding someone doing that. I'm amazed that John was able to make those Spider-Man stories when he was drawing them as coherent because he was constantly, constantly being yanked one way or the other, either by Stan uh, or by Saul Brodsky as production manager who had his own needs. You know, maybe somebody else who, need, who needed some help, myself occasionally. He was constantly being pulled one way or the other. And then he had to get back and, and plot and just say, where did I leave Spider-Man hanging from a roof? Or you know? yeah. so, it, so it was a very difficult situation. And John really had it harder than a lot of people because everyone depended on him at some stage or the other much more than it, it looked like. And there wasn't any way to draw a chart for Martin Goodman that showed that. Wow. And uh, Mr. Starling, you? What was uh, some work that you, Mr. Uh, Ramita did that was very impressive to you and left an inspir inspired you in some way? There you, go. you sounded like a robot for a long time. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You're, oh, I, 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 it, oh, it kicked back in. It kicked back it in. It kicked back in. Now we can hear you. Yes. Well, you can hear me? Question to me. Yeah. Your question was, uh, what was uh, an ins like uh, something that John did that like inspired you? What a work that like something that you 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 remember or something that was very inspirational to you in your work. You know, it was watching him dealing with people, which I always found the most impressive. Wow! Like what Roy was saying, uh, he was constantly being interrupted as he was uh, producing these Spider Man. One of his jobs was, and in fact, I was working with him trying to help him out with layouts and he was working with this guy named Maury. I can't remember his last name. Uh, who was filling in Maury black Maury. Yeah. And uh, but John was as he was inking, he was always filling in his own blacks. And Maury would come along and say, Don't do that and finally put up a sign saying, John, no blacks. Mm -hmm. And uh, within a week or so, uh, John among his jobs was to look at new people's artwork. And one of the first people that came in was Ron Wilson, who happened to be a black man. And <laughs> there was uh, the sign on top of his desk saying, John, no blacks. And <laughs> Ron looked at it and looked at Ron and went, sorry, this has nothing to do with anything. And they went on like, I'm <laughs> sitting over there going, I couldn't have handled that that smoothly. Uh, <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> Go ahead, Jamie. What about you? Um, what was the question exactly? That just like that is so funny. I've never heard that story. <laughs> <laughs> no black. No, no black. Yeah. <laughs> no, um a, a, some work that John did that was very impressionable to you and inspired you. I mean, all of his Spider-Man, that's that was my childhood, but um I he actually told me about Alex Toth when I was young. And I I mean I I would have never known who Alex Toth was. I mean, he was telling me who he was inspired by. And he would, I mean, he inspired me by checking out other artists that inspired him, which I thought was, that stands out in my mind, just him sharing where he got inspired and seeing what he did with his inspiration. And um, the first appearance of Mary Jane, I mean, <laughs> so that, that stands out in my mind. You know, she wasn't just behind a plant or behind here. Or you actually saw this beautiful face. Um, all of his stuff, was, but Spider-Man is my childhood, so. And you, Steve, Houston? No, it's, it's funny, um, I'm in agreement. I think maybe uh, Brian will agree with me here. But, uh, by the time we get to 1971, 72, 73, he, in my opinion, is in his peak. And those issues of Amazing Spider-Man between uh, 103 and 119, 120 are absolutely sensational. I mean, I just, I was just like, wow. But again, uh, Jamie is correct. His drawings of women, and for me, of course, I'm a big sucker for women with big eyelashes. And he used to, <laughs> and so when I first saw Satana, I was like, I have to find myself a lady that looks like Satana. I don't know <laughs> to find one of those because they didn't exist in England, all those dark haired ladies. And, uh, 
I was like, wow, but those eyelashes. And I was very fortunate a couple of years later to come across some of the romance stuff that he drew. Oh, and of course, uh, you got the John Romita, the John Basema, and Gene Colan in this like issue. Like, what in that? Woo! Unbelievable. So, uh, again, that era, 1971 to 73, many people don't you know equate that because they're always talking about the early, but it's being a coming a craftsman. But that, that drawing of Satana still has a special place in my heart. <laughs> hey, and, and Mr. Starlin, you should know, Steve's love of his life is Moon Dragon. I'm just throwing that out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't imagine why. <laughs> Watch our episode on that one. <laughs> I want to say something about John Romita and, and DC Comics. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I like DCU Comics. I work for him from time to time and so forth. But it, I was just discussing with somebody at lunch today. Uh, the amazement that in the 1960s, up through 1964, you know, 60, until 65, for about eight years or so there, uh, they had John Romita, as well as Gene Colan and other people, but they had John Romita in their romance department, their very departmental you know, company, uh, doing romance comics, doing a wonderful job selling those romance comics. So, I mean, you know, he was definitely earning his money there because those, those did well and his were considered some of the, the very best and most popular. But the amazement to me, when I looked back and realized that John Romita had been this person with no signature that occasionally I would see on the romance covers, and that when they they started Doom Patrol and they had a they had a romance artist draw that Bruno Premiani who was like nice but totally un, you know and they had this guy they had this guy they you know okay Ross Andrew he was a superhero artist they had different people drawing all these superheroes and yet it, they had one of the best superhero artists of all time there. And he never drew a superhero for DC Comics because they didn't know it. Yeah, they you know, young love and just like because women were too good looking. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if any of them had gone back to '54 and those Captain America stories, maybe they would have, you know, been able to make better use of him. But of course, my, my favorite thing about him was how he told uh, uh, John would tell how he was all set to go. What was it? Was it BBD and O or one of the very big advertising agencies? Mm -hmm. And he was all set to start a job on Monday there and stan took him out to lunch and said you know ah you know you go to this you're gonna you, okay you're gonna make more money maybe you know, all that you know but you know stan never cared about money but anyway so uh said but you know you're gonna be a little tiny fish in a great big pond as you come over here you can be a big fish in a little pond i don't know how <laughs> that really is. but anyway somehow he seduced john into giving up this job that would have been in a certain sense a, a dream job and more security probably you know a comic book field you know 1965 that was not would have been considered by most people a growth industry you know and yet there he was later on and uh, i don't know you know he I, I don't know how john ever you know how he felt at the end of his life about his career but you know it was a great career and uh, comic books were made so much better by the fact that he stayed in them instead of going into mm -hmm. faceless advertising yeah it's awesome. And, and winding this down, uh, let's 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 go. I'm going to go around the horn here and uh, say what what is John Romita's legacy? What do we think? How like where does he stand amongst? Obviously, he's the sin's political school, but what where do you think he goes? Where do you think that legend goes? Steve, we'll start with you, uh, Mr. Houston. For me personally, I think it uh, is quintessential beautiful line work. Finally, we had some art that could be put on cups and T-shirts and pillows, and it was beautiful, marketable, and as soon as you saw those drawings, you are done. So when, whenever I think of John Romita Sr., I always think of ultra-professional, modern marketing material. I'm sorry yeah. you couldn't do that with the deep coat. But when it comes to, uh, you know, Romita, beautiful, clean, professional. Lines. Perfect. Mr. Engelhack? Well, yeah, all of everything that everybody said about the art is all true. Um, but I think part of his legacy, going back to what Roy was talking about with being pulled in all different directions, I mean, I sat next to him for a, you know, for a while and was one of the people who pulled him in a direction every day when he wasn't doing something. But I think, you know, he was the kind of guy who he had the Spider-Man 
thing in his head, what he was going to do. And if he was going to talk to you for a while, he was going to talk to you for a while, he was going to do this. And then he would sit down and he would draw what he was supposed to draw, you know, and the, and the sort of calm, just total competence is, is I think was, you know, certainly inspiring to me. And I think it was probably inspiring to pretty much everybody who might have worked with him or around him in those days, just as like, John Jr. talked about this a little bit from his perspective, but I mean, he was a mentor, not in the sense that he would take you aside and, and I mean, he did that too, but it, but he was a mentor and, and just sort of showing you that a, you could do this job and you could be a good person at the same time and you could take care of whatever business you had to take care of. It was a very, almost, I want to say Zen approach. I mean, he just, he was inspiring to to work with you know work around i didn't work with him that much but i mean you know um i think a lot of comic book artists would would talk about having hung out with with john ramita and and be the better for it wow mr polito well in my view the work of john ramita not only as an illustrator but as an art director at marvel I would assert that the sheer force of that work caused Marvel and comics to explode onto the main street. I think there were a lot of mechanics that were involved and there were pieces of the puzzle were coming into, but it's just the sheer power of the work just catapulted it. So that would be my view. And I, wow. I think that that's under-realized. I, uh, I think it's just the sheer sheer outrageous and phenomenal quality of the work just forced it out and so many people embraced it. No. Mr. Starlin? Marvel was sort of started by Stan and uh, Jack and uh, Steve and Don Heck and a couple others. But there were the folks like yourself, Roy, John Buscema, Gene Colin, and at the foremost, probably John, who came along and they built that rickety framework that was the beginning of Marvel and turned it into this steam, this steamship that just chugged along perfectly. Uh, and I think that's John's uh, biggest legacy is the fact that he helped put it into cement. Wow. Jamie? Um. I mean, I could sit here and say exactly what all of you said, but I was having dinner with Jim Serenko the other night, and we were talking about Neil Adams. Um, it's his birthday today, by the way. Happy birthday, Neil. Miss you. Um, yeah. But um, we were talking about Neil, and we, we brought up, you know, John. And we were talking about the fact that this, their work is going to last a lifetime. It is unforgettable. That is their legacy. They lived to work, and their work was their life. They loved their work. And that is that is going to be around far longer than we are. You know what I mean? I think that their legacy was the fact that they loved their work and it showed. Yeah, Roy? Okay. Well, two things, uh, two things. One is that in the uh, in the days, particularly in the uh, days after uh, first Ditko and then Jack Kirby left, there were two people really important for the next decade or something in setting the, the, Marvel, the Marvel style and with, with room for other people to do their thing and yet a certain center that you knew was sort of the gravity in a way that was holding things together. One was John Buscema, the other was John Ramita. And Ramita was a little more at the center because he was right there in, in the office where John Buscema was just doing it by example. Uh, to me though, with all the other things and, and everything that everyone says is true about John, to me, his greatest legacy will be that he's the person, of, he's the reason we can say that that the character Spider-Man had two quintessential artists, you know. Usually the quintessential artist is the one who creates him, and certainly nobody's gonna ever take that away from Ditko or ever should try, and, and John would've been the last person to do that. But what John maybe took a long time to realize, maybe he never did, was that he was the other quintessential artist, the, the one who in his own way was almost as important, you know, and maybe just as important as the guy who, who had artistically created Spider-Man. Uh, he took him to new heights and, uh, you know, since he became the most 
popular, famous, and, and archetypal Marvel character, well, you know, he took him to the absolute pinnacle. You can't take any character any higher than that. So uh, I think, I think, I think that in many ways, to the world at least, they can't see the subtle things, perhaps that John did, uh, the things he, the things he held together in the art direction, all those things. I think the legacy, in a way, will be. Uh, I don't know how many issues, but between penciling, inking, and just overseeing when he was guiding Gil Kane and Ross Andrew and other artists and that, uh, I think his legacy is uh, really is, is the second quintessential artist on Spider-Man. Wow. And with that, Niall, do you have any uh, last things? Yeah, I do. Because, you know, we've been talking about John and, and his work and, you know, all he's done to inspire all of us, especially as artists who strive to be, you know, like him. And not, you got to throw Jim into that as well. You know, just those are the guys that, you know, we want to draw like. But what I'd like to know from you guys, if no, Jamie, don't do that. Um, <laughs> I, I got to butter him up. Come on. Um, but uh, what I'd like to know, though, is like, uh, is, do you guys have any fun stories? Maybe something out of the office, out of the bullpen, you know, maybe some fun stories that happened at a convention, at a dinner. Was there any memorable moments you guys have uh, with John Romita, maybe outside of, of the workspace? My FaceTime call was pretty memorable. He had no idea what FaceTime was. And he's like, I can see James. You can see me? Can you see me? <laughs> it was the cutest. I will never forget this moment. It was like the sweetest thing. And he, oh. starts, he looks at Virginia and he's like, Virginia, she can see me. <laughs> it was adorable. Spencer Beck actually was the one showing him how it worked. And I was the first person that came to mind to test him. That, that was, was just adorable. Adorable. Yeah. I actually have something pretty funny back in like 2007. This was during my uh, my bigger bodybuilding days, and I was uh, I was I was working for a production company, and uh, we we uh, we put out these web series. And I remember it was it we were in New York Comic Con, and this is at the time when it wasn't the big explosion. And like now, you guys are bigger than ever, all you guys. But at that time, it was still kind of like it was still kind of passive. And I saw it. John Romita and John Romita Jr. sitting there, and I'm like, oh, my God. And at that time, I had a tank top on, and I was all tanned and stuff. So I walk up there, and I'm like, I'm just going to say hi to John Romita. So I walk up to him, and John Romita touches my, my shoulder. He goes, are you Italian? And I, go, and I go, yeah. I go, I'm Sicilian. He goes, oh, I go, I'm half Sicilian. He goes, I'm Sicilian too. And he goes, and then this was the most funniest thing. And my friend was filming this. I, I have to find this footage. It's hilarious. And John goes, I, he must have been bored. He goes, let me see your flex. So John Romita gets up and he starts flexing. And you see John Romita Jr., he's all embarrassed. And John starts flexing. And I start flexing with him. I'm looking at my friend and I go, are you getting this? He goes, yeah. And he goes, and he goes how do you get that big? I go, meatballs. And then he looks at me and he goes, and spaghetti. <laughs> it was such a weird thing. And I said, thank you. It was just, I was like, so I have to find that footage and I'll put that up. It was just so bizarre and all that. But that was a weird thing. I guess they were bored that day, you know, and uh, that was great to say. But uh, that yeah. was my story back in 2007. Yeah, do you have a story? Uh, one that uh, Jim Steranko told us this past weekend. Oh um, uh -oh. Jim got, has, had gotten some of his artwork back from Marvel when he was doing the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but not all of it, because a lot of it disappeared or just misplaced. Or and stolen. He, or stolen. And he said that one day he was at a convention like 15, 20 years later, and uh, John Romita called him over and said, hey, come here, come here, I have something for you. And uh, it turned out it was one of Franco's uh, Agent of Shields covers. And he said, yeah, uh, Marvel sent this back to me a long time ago by mistake, and I've been waiting to see you to give it back. And this is the first time we actually run into each other. And Stranko was blown away because at that point, that cover was probably worth about $20,000. Fifty thousand. Yeah. So, uh, and he said, "Yeah, John just said this is. I've been holding on to this. Had to get it to you. Here you go." I've been going through San Diego Comic Con with this piece just yeah, to San give Diego. it back. Oh. And, and he just walked away afterwards. Biggest you know? heart. Biggest yeah. heart. Yeah. Wow. Steve, any stories? Uh, Mr. Engelhart. Oh, sorry. No. I, you know, <laughs> sorry, Mr. I'm Houston. Steve Junior. Steve Junior. <laughs> <laughs> I live 3,000 miles away from you guys, or most of you guys, so 
I mean, I knew him in that in that era that I talked about, but I didn't run into him, you know, after that. I, so, mm-hmm. got nothing. What about Roy? You got any bar stories? Come on, you got to have something. <laughs> I've already you know? told most of my stories. I just remember, you know, how... Maybe I, wearing I a Spider-Man was more architect- <laughs> Well... Go. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know who that guy is in that costume. <laughs> he he hasn't had a better figure then than he does now, anyway, you know, and so forth. But um, the, the thing, I don't know why, but the thing I keep remembering I think the so, yeah. was, the, was the idea that, of him looking at, looking at my plate. John, <laughs> John your, your audio is tinning again. Oh, well, we are up here in the, you know, out in the negative zone. You know, <laughs> Where is well, the negative zone, exactly? South Carolina's in the middle of South Carolina. <laughs> Roy's, Roy's estate is bigger than the entire town. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, in, in ending here, this will be pretty good. Uh, I always love this. I, I don't know if you guys saw this, but Roy did a big write up on uh, Jim, I mean, on John. And I, I, I found something in Marvel 2 in 1 annual number one. And it was, it was, a, it was a beautiful, it was. Um, it was a beautiful little guest appearance by by uh, little uh, Johnny Ramita. Can you put that one up, uh, Niall? And Roy, can you explain it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a scene. I think it's I think it's set in 1942. That's all my college books. Uh, in uh, in Times Square, Johnny told me a year or two or so before that he used to run errands back and forth between businesses. I can't remember the details anymore, but he ran between here and there, you know, physically behind him just to carry the stuff. During, during World War II, so when I had the story set there, uh, I just had asked uh, Sal Pesela to, uh, to draw little Johnny Ramita. I said, this is what he looked like. I didn't have any pictures. I said, well, just draw John Ramita. Make him look down here. John later said, well, you know, I really was, I was a skinny kid back then. I wasn't really, you know, fleshed out. Then. <laughs> so, <laughs> he was kind of pleased to uh, to see that. But, that's, but you know, if that had really been taking place with Ben Grimm and his things, <laughs> says there at the very end. He goes, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to remember you, kid, when I get back. back. Back where I came from. Like, I love that because, and then John Romita's legacy has begun. Because he was, after all, the second person ever to uh, draw the Fantastic Four. Yes. Really, you know, in his own book. And by the way, once again, for those few issues that uh, that he took over when Jack left, his sales went up. <laughs> so the several issues he was on, and they sort of leveled off when, uh, and the book is good. But I, I always wondered if John if John Romita had stayed on Fantastic Four, another book he did not want to do, uh, as in in Jack's shadow. I wondered, you know, would, would it have stayed up an even higher, you know, basis uh, at a higher level than it was, or or uh, was it just out of curiosity to see what the hell Marvel was going to do now that Jack was doing the Fantastic Four? That's a what if we'll never know the uh, the answer to. Them. So, in, in ending here, I'd like to thank everybody for for coming and showing up. Brian, Jamie, Jim, Steve, Steve, and Niall, always putting it together. And of course, Roy the boy, Stanley, and then next to uh, in spirit to John Ramita Senior, who uh, and John Ramita Junior, who uh, showed up earlier. I mean, it's it's an honor. We we. Thanks for doing this. I know it was on short notice, but we, we, yes, thank you. It's like you guys said, it's like you said, Jamie, actually, it's like every great artist and all you guys do it that, um, have this is that every artist wants their work to outlive them. And John Ramita is just another person that has that because obviously it's sad that he's gone, but he's here forever and he'll always be in the stories and everything. And, uh, and you guys have a piece of that too, because you guys uh, are going down that same path and uh, gonna, your legacies will always live on. And people like me, Steve and Niall are always going to be here to cheer you on and, uh, and, and, and say you guys are the best. And one more thing, Jim Starlin, can you give uh, Steve uh, Houston Moon Dragon's number? He wants to call her. He needs to call. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid she's engaged in other um, business these days. Sorry. Oh, I'll just keep waiting. I'll just keep waiting quietly and patiently. 
Yeah, yeah she's not gone after the, on to the other team now, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. <laughs> can we switch back? She's a goddess. She she a couple drinks might get you there, Steve. She can change her mind, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Steve, get us out of here. Thank you, guys. Right, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Boom. Thank you, guys. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us on Pop XP. If you haven't already, make sure to click that subscribe button and also click the bell for notifications when we go live and we upload some awesome new content. Also, don't forget to head on over to Twitter and follow us at the Pop XP and over on Instagram at the Pop XP. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you soon.